Then I'm going to ask you to go ahead and have a seat, but let's stand just for a moment, all of us, and let's go before the Lord and let's pray. Father, our prayer today is help. We need your presence. We need you to come and be the teacher of the church, Holy Spirit. Those that are not feeling well today, while the word of God is being preached, we're asking that you heal them, Lord. You don't need a man to heal people. You, your love heals people because you love people. And we just thank you, God, that you're going to bless us with the word, that it becomes alive on the inside of us today, God. How grateful will we be? And Father, that we would not only learn the truth, but we would learn how to live by the truth. Not just hear this, but do it, Lord. We thank you. And we ask you to bless all the churches in the empire as well as around the planet. Father, I just read an article the other day about the fastest growing church in the world. The underground church in Iran. Our persecuted brothers and sisters that are ready for persecution by the thousands that are coming to you, Jesus. I also heard that you have shown up to preach to them, God. I know not whether or not this is a fact. I only read the article, Lord. And God, we are grateful for the salvation under Jesus Christ in Iran. And we thank you for this as a mighty move of the Spirit of God is upon the earth, Lord. Let it be so in our midst. In Jesus' mighty name. We're all in agreement with a great big shout, we say. Amen. Amen. Is that cool? All right. Oh, okay. All you guys go away. It's okay. We're, we're you know, just go away. We're going to have church here. So, by the way, thank you so much. You did such a great job. Did they do good? Jared, I love that last song. And I love the song before that, Grace. Grace makes me absolutely cry. You know, it's by your grace. And by, he just pulled me out of mess. Thanks so much for singing that today. It's wonderful. Wow, we just love our guys. And in a couple of weeks, they're going to sound so good that your tongue is going to jump out of your head and slap your brain. That's how good they're going to sound. It's going to be so wonderful. You're going to absolutely love them. Today, as we go into the word of the Lord, we're going to go to, if you will, part two of a life series. In the life series, we're going to be talking about marriage, which some of you say, I don't want to hear about marriage. I had a lousy marriage. I don't like marriage. I don't want to ever be married again. I know, but you probably will know people that are married and maybe you can help them so they don't have to have a lousy marriage. Or you could be like me that says, I am never getting married again. And then I saw Deborah across the room and said, ooh, she looks good. (laughs) And when I said, ooh, she looks good, God said, oh, you better say that. And so for 41 years of marriage, I tell you, I am happy that I got married again. And um, I'm happy that... Only God can bring you the right person. But when he brings you the right person, you ought to know what it's all about. One of the series in the life series is going to take place is finances and job. Employee, employer relationship. How many of you would like to be the employer instead of being the employee? There's a key to this in scripture, and you'll find out what it is. We'll be going there. Of course, we're not going to do that today, but we'll be doing it in the future. And then we're going to be talking about a lot of subjects about life. Before we do, let's do this real quick. Let's greet all the people that are here for the very first time. So, ushers, stand to your feet. If you're here for the first time, we will not embarrass you. We'll just hand you something. Is that okay? Give you some information about the Rock Church World Outreach Center. Please just raise your hand so they can spot you. There's some folks back there. Anybody else? There's some folks back over there. God bless you. There's some more folks back there. Go ahead. Just raise your hand. They'll get it to you. There's some more folks. Just keep your hand up. They'll get it to you. 
God bless you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We're so excited about you being here. There's a little card inside. Fill it out. Drop it in the offering basket when it goes by. And then meet some of the pastors over on the right-hand side. When you go out, there's cookies and donuts and coffee and tea waiting for you. And you can chat with some of the pastors, find out how things work around here. We won't bug you, but we'll pray for you. Is that okay? We just love you so much. Again, today we're talking about the life series, part number two. We're going into the part what God says about marriage, and uh, we're going to be covering some of the commandments, if you will, to the men. There's also women. I think Deborah is going to do some of that next week. That should be fun. And um, I'm going to record it so that when she doesn't do it, I can play it back to her. <laughs> and so <laughs> check out the overhead screens, if you would for this little video announcement. I'm bored. Me too. If only there was something we could play. Whoa. Now there is the Game of Life Marriage best. Edition. Ew! We're not married! It's a game everyone can play and learn from. One, two, three. We just bought a new car! Yes! yes. Wait, it's red. So? We just got my new car! You know I don't like red! Well, you don't have to use it. Fighting over what to eat. That's silly. Nobody fights over food. Everyone knows the best place to eat is... Del Taco! Ew! That's just disgusting! One, two, three. Stop. Go to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center? Let's see what the Rock Church says. Oh! Here's a quick recap. Point number one. Be the spiritual head of the wife. Point number two. We are to love our wives and give of ourselves. And point number three. Make your wife happy and fulfill the feast. Marriage isn't a game, but it's supposed to be fun. Get the knowledge you need to have a winning marriage. Isn't that cool? I hope you could hear it. Um, listen, real quick, how about everybody just getting your Bible and going with me? We'll start right off with our text today. We'll spend a few moments listening to what God says about marriage. Let me just say some things before we do. Listen closely. Um, there's nothing better in the world than a great marriage. There's nothing worse in this world, I think, than a lousy marriage. And some of you are sitting in here and you have a boring, maybe possibly lousy marriage. Some of you in here have already gone through all that and are trying to figure out what the heck happened. Before I read today's text, I want to give you a little testimony on my life. A lot of you know it, but most of you don't. Just so that you can understand where we're coming from and why it's important. In my mid-twenties, by the time I was 25 or 26, I had been married three times. It was like the worst thing that you could ever do is be divorced three times. In those days, that was quite a, that was, you know, 400 years ago. In those days, being married and divorced one time made you an outcast to everything. In fact, People thought you just lost your salvation. They really thought you were as bad as any murderer there was that walked upon the planet being divorced just one time. I wasn't divorced one time. I was divorced three times. Miserable, miserable. Didn't know why, never left anybody. They all dumped me. And I remember the third marriage... I married her for 58 days, came home, and there was sawdust all over the front porch of the house. And I put my key in to go into the house, and that key wouldn't fit. Locks had been changed. I couldn't figure out, and then there was a note that I saw that said, contact my attorney after 58 days. I had no idea what I had done wrong whatsoever. I married the first woman two times, so that 
and a divorce. She divorced me twice. She wanted to make it a third time, but I said, no, you've run off with enough people in my life. I'm, I'm over that, and I'm not going to get hurt anymore. And of course, she, uh, it was miserable. So by the time the third one came along after 58 days, I literally considered myself probably the biggest loser in the world. Heartache. If you've ever gone through a divorce, I'm telling you what it's like. It's six months of sleepless nights. Six months of pain that I still, to this very day, feel. Six months of rejection and hurt. It was the most miserable time of my entire life. So I decided what I'm going to do is get serious about God and go to church. Surely God, who created marriage, ought to know how to do marriage the right way. And I'll, I'll seek him. And I remember going to four churches, four, all four of them heard that I had been divorced three times and asked me to leave their church. Asked me to leave. I, I don't know if you've ever known what it's like to be down and out and hurting and have someone come and reject you from a church. I thought I had literally lost my life and ruined my life, but I also lost God because I didn't know anything about God in those days. And I thought literally that I had, that God didn't even want me. And I want you to know something. I just couldn't get away from picking up the Bible and I, I started to read. And I'm not a good reader at all, but I started to read and I read slow. And I asked God to show me things that well, he really wanted because I, I couldn't believe that God would reject me because I, I, was, I felt like I was innocent through this whole thing. I didn't run off with anybody. I didn't leave anybody. I was trying to fulfill a commitment that we made towards each other, but I couldn't do it on their part. And there one day I found some scripture, which we'll go to today, on marriage that literally set me free and helped me so that when Deborah came along we discussed this and literally the eight commandments to the husband that I found and the four commandments to the wife that I found in the scripture became our wedding vows towards each other the beauty of the whole thing is not too long after we were married, somehow, by some strange event, I became a pastor. I couldn't imagine being a pastor, but I somehow had a group of people that we were talking with, and I was the pastor. And that's how it all started, with a lot of counseling with broken people, and most of them in marriage. Each week, I would have one or two counseling on marriage. Each week, I would have to rehearse the four and the eight until it became so a part of me that even to this day, when Debbie and I have problems, and we do at times get angry and disappointed with each other, discouraged with each other, the verses come up and it's because we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. And then we get back to doing them. Life becomes wonderful. And that's really what this is all about today as we look at the scripture. It's not you just sitting there listening today. This is going to prod you. But it's you becoming part of what the word of God has to say in your life. And when you do... It becomes the glue that holds you together. It's like a little boy who builds a model airplane. He puts it all together and all the pieces are fine and he throws it to fly and it goes across the room for about four or five feet or 10 feet. Then it starts to fall apart and the parts start to fall off of it. And then it hits the ground and it's broken and he's bitter over it because it broke up. He forgot to put the glue in the building of that model in order for it to fly and keep on holding together. The glue in a marriage is what God says about a marriage and has to be there all the time in order for you to get past the times when you're discouraged with each other. 
And there's so many people that don't put glue in their marriage, which is the word of God that holds you together. They just want to exist and do life, but they miss the glue of their life. In every area, it's the word of God. And that's why I love this church, because we come together and what do we do? We talk about the Bible so that we can learn the truth and learn how to apply the truth. And that's what this is all about today, applying the truth in the area of marriage of your life. Especially for those that are wondering, man, this is lousy or this isn't working well. We're only gonna talk about three of the 12 commandments God gives husbands and wives. Eight to the husband, four for the wife. This is number five, excuse me, number four. But first let's read, if you will, in Colossians, the third chapter, verse number 17 through verse number 19. I'll put it up on the overhead for you. I'll read it with you. Is that okay? And it says, whatever you do in word and deed. Now stop right there. Look back up at me. Whatever you do, here's God speaking to us. The revelation of God, whatever you do, whatever you do is whatever you do. I mean, that's what that really means in the original text. All the original text says, well, here's what the original text means. It means whatever you do, whatever you do. He says, well, in word or deed, I don't know if you can do anything else besides speaking and what your actions are, but that's what he says. And whatever you do, he says this, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you're fighting and cussing and and flipping off your husband or wife behind their back and and yelling at each other, come on, you know what I'm talking about. Try to do it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. (laughs) Somehow, man, it just does not fit. Is anybody listening to me? It just does, it does not fit. So when it doesn't fit, you don't wear it. You gotta get out of it and get where something does fit. He says, do in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God. There's no way you could be in this harsh, has anybody, no, don't even raise your hand. Don't even look the other way. Everybody look the other way because I don't even wanna see your faces. But I know this, has anybody ever used high school words in a fight with a husband and wife? You know what I mean by high school words. Oh, San Bernardino is so quiet. They say, oh no, we never have. We're nice. I'm just kidding, some of you pulled out a knife or two. And uh, not only the words. (laughs) And so uh, he says, give thanks to the little father through him. The very next verse, he starts to talk about marriage. And he just gives you a peek insight on how really the marriage ought to be, but then he comes along, he makes a statement that is really good uh, in a different text in the book of Ephesians, but he says these words, wives, submit yourself to your husbands. This is so frustrating because listen, this is only part of what it's all about. When the, listen to me wives, why it's not so discouraging. When the husband is doing what he's supposed to do, nothing could be easier than to submitting to your husband. Uh, Listen to what I just said. And so you say, well, I'll submit to him if he does that. No, you submit to him not because he does it or doesn't do it. You submit to him because God said to submit to him. And then God will straighten him out about what to do. So wives, submit yourself. And that's only one. Remember, there's a whole bunch more. And you're going to have to see those and how they all work together. But it's very easy to do. It's called order. Where there's marriage designed by God, there's always order. Everything in God's system has order. For an example, if you take the sand off the beach and place it in your eye, the sand from the beach doesn't belong in your eye and therefore it's out of order and it's irritating to your existence. And everything has order, so this is the order. And it, it completely, it completely uh, 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 makes it very difficult when you have a society that says that's a ridiculous statement. It is a ridiculous statement unless you have a marriage in Christ and then it becomes the order of God and God blesses that which is in order. Is anybody listening? So he says these words, and then why submit yourself to husbands fitting in the Lord? We'll talk about that later on. But verse number uh, 19 says, um, husbands, love your wives. And then he makes this crazy little statement. Do, watch this, do not be bitter towards them. Why would he just, out of the blue, love your wife, don't be bitter. 
Bitter is something that comes that used to be sweet and now it's turned sour. Let me, let me play this game with you. Is that okay? You ready to play a game? Let's play this game. <clears throat> I'm going to say a sentence. I want you to finish it. And as I say the sentence, it's really easy for you to finish. But let's see if we can do that together. Um, familiarity breeds... Let's try it one more time. One person got it. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. I already know you and Anne have a great marriage. So, uh, but it's true. Familiarity breeds what? Contempt. Contempt. It shouldn't be that way. It should not be that more familiar you have in a marriage that the more you become bitter over the marriage. And what happens is you will become bitter if the glue is not applied because then all the little things of the person's character starts to rub on you the wrong way. Things that you didn't see before you got married. And so in order to take this into a deeper understanding, we're going to have to go into the text as Paul writes to the church at Ephesus. The church at Ephesus is, is being bombarded and Paul is giving them instructions under the Holy Spirit about the marriage. And this is actually where I found, if you will, the eight and the four commandments. So let's go with me to the fifth chapter. And today we're kind of zeroing in on three points that God makes for the husband. And out of those three points, you'll find two of them in verse number 29 of the fifth chapter of Ephesians. In the chapter of Ephesians, before I read it to you, just let me give you point number four. Take care of and provide for your wife. There's something built on the inside of us men that desire to provide. One of the most discouraging times, women, you need to hear this. In a man's life is when he's lost his job and he's wandering by himself, not being able to take care of his family, not being able to be the hero of the house. When you're no longer able to produce and God wants men to produce so that they can provide for the family. Oftentimes you will see families that are so dysfunctional, why? Because the husband has been removed from the house. And when, in America right now, one of the great things is the husband is no longer there. They've moved on in their own selfish ways without Christ, making decisions for themselves, leaving families to try to fend for themselves, and you find that family having a difficult time trying to exist. It is not what God had in mind. It is not the plan of God, and it is certainly not the order of God. But you see this all the time throughout our society. Why? Because the social systems don't work. God's word does work. And you're going to have to come to a place where you realize that what's really truth is what God says. And when God says that a man is to provide, he doesn't just say, go out and do it. There's something on the inside of you that wants to be successful, that wants to provide, that wants to meet the needs, that wants to fulfill that family obligation, taking on the responsibility that God has given to us as men. And they want to do that. And oftentimes we try to circumvent it, but it's still built on the inside of me. I mean, I'm retired and I still want to take care of my Debbie. I still want to provide for her. I still want to meet her needs. Tell you the truth, here's how Debbie loves me. She doesn't love me like you understand with flowers and candy. She loves me with respect and honor. And it's hard to get respect and honor when you're not doing the job of providing. And women need to be sensitive during those periods of time. Men are crabby and upset and life is bad and they're not getting along and they're fighting more than ever before because all of a sudden they have gotten out of the role of provision, making it and becoming the hero inside the house. You'll find most times in scripture, this is sort of interesting, where it tells the wife, it tells the husband to love his wife. That's what it says. Husbands, love your wife. But it doesn't say to the wife to love your husband. What it says is the wife is to honor and respect the husband. 
because love to me is when Debbie thinks I'm cool <laughs> and thinks I'm great and builds me up. That's love to me. Hate to me is when she blows me off and says, forget it, I don't wanna be around you. I don't. And she thinks lowly of me. That's the worst moment of my life. After all these years, 41 years, 12 grandchildren, four children later. We finally are learning how to do this. So he says these words that are so powerful, if you will, in Ephesians 5.21, he says, yeah, uh, 5.29, excuse me. He says this, for no one ever yet hated his flesh. No, I don't hate my flesh. I mean, I want to do something about my flesh. Well, here's what we find out is the wife is my flesh, is an extension of my flesh. I remember one time when Deborah crashed her car into a fence. She came back into the house that we were living in at that time, a little rental house, when we first started this church. And she looks at me and she says, uh oh. I said, what? She says, well, we just crashed the car into the fence. She played that oneness card. Are you hearing me? And you know, so we don't, our wife is an extension of us. And so here he says, we are to, like we would for ourselves, nourish and cherish it. Two commandments there. Number one, nourish. Number four is written just like this. And it's what it says. To nourish means to build up to fullness. Is to build her up to fullness. I cannot build Deborah up to her fullness. But yet that's what God is requesting of me to nourish. Like I would nourish anyone. Anybody that's malnutrition is operating in their life. They fail. They get sick. They die. Even plants tell us that all the time. So my job is to make sure she gets to a place where she can go and live her life out in the fullness of the Lord. But it's not me that can do that. Only the Holy Spirit can bring her to fullness. So I've got to constantly bring her to a place where she is talking about, thinking about, applying in her life and going and operating. That's what church is all about. When a husband comes along and says, man, this is a beautiful day. Let's take it off, go to the park with our kids. And I say, hey, have fun. Do it on some other day. This is church day. Or do it after church. My goodness, this church has services all the time. Do it on Saturday. Do it on Sunday. But you don't have to give up the entire day. Get to a place where you can nourish. Because if you don't nourish, they don't grow. And if they grow the wrong way, your life becomes miserable. Let me say that again, because only two people in the front row got it. When they grow the wrong way with the wrong stuff, your life becomes miserable. You know, I can nourish somebody by giving them french fries every meal. But they're going to grow up and be one big giant pimple. And they're not going to be happy with life. And they're not going to be healthy in life. You got to take it to the right thing that helps them to be happy and healthy. And guess what? Nourishment means, let's, listen, for me in my house, here ought to be the commandment of every husband in this place. For me in my house, we will serve the Lord. Is anybody listening? So husband's job is to nourish her. To nourish and make sure that she's getting fed the right stuff. What's the right stuff to bring her to fullness but the Word of God? Amen. You could have communion in your house. You ever stop and just put side, have communion? You can have prayer meetings in your house. Let's pray to God. Most men feel funny about praying. Did you know that? They don't like to pray. And I'm right there with you. You can ask Deborah. I don't like to pray. She says, let's pray. Debbie's, I happen to be blessed because Debbie's incredibly spiritual. But I remember I have had the experience with three others that weren't. And guess which one I like? It's her. Why? Because she's spiritual. She is fed all the time. I'll never forget the time she said to me, I, we went to his party. We were doing business and building houses. 
And they had this big builder's party with all, you know, the ice chiseling and the free shrimp and booze and alcohol just flowing everywhere. And business people were there and the bankers were there. And everybody was having this big house party. And I'll never forget this. I don't know if you remember. It just popped into my mind. And, and uh, I remember Debbie and I went to this party. We were like fish out of water. She got home. I, she says to me, she says, uh, is that all there is? In the business world? I said, yeah. She, I said, well, what do you want? She says, well, I want to be in ministry somewhere doing something for Jesus. Because she had been fed enough all of her life to know what maturity felt like and fullness felt like. Yeah, yeah. That's where our job as husbands to make sure that we're in that kind of a spot. Right. Is anybody listening? Yes. Here's number four, five for us. I like number five a lot because number five is found in the same verse, verse number 29. Notice it again. Let's look at verse number 29. Pop it up. And it says to cherish. You will nourish your own body and you will cherish your own body. A lot of times people don't understand what the word cherish means. The word cherish means to place a value on. If you don't have the right value on your wife, you'll become bitter. And that's why he said that, if you will, in the book of Colossians. Men, don't become bitter. How do you be bitter, bitter if you've got a value on her? And for me, the most important thing outside of my relationship with Jesus Christ, even above my own children, job, or anything, is my wife. She is valuable to me. I like being around her. And so we find that number five is place a great value on your wife. Place that value. You've got to take it and say, this was the most important thing in my life is her. I place that value. I place her as valuable. Did you know when something is valuable in your life, you will protect it? Yes, sir. Is anybody listening? If you had gold bars, let's say, you know, 24 karat gold bars, probably worth $140,000, $150,000, would you leave them in the back seat of your car when you come into the parking lot at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center saying, wow, we're just in church and everybody's fine. Nobody certainly would steal anything from the church. <laughs> we have guards out there. It's like the piranha know the parking lot. You better lock your door. You wouldn't do that. Can I tell you a little fun story just for a second? Take a little sidestep just for a moment. You know, the sec third song that we sang, uh, Great Is Your Grace, was written by one of our music ministers. His name is uh, David Archibek. He's now down at the Rock Church of Temecula. David had a whole album that he wrote. It was really cool music. Great Is Your Grace is one of them. David was a music minister that came from New Mexico. And when we interviewed, <laughs> when we interviewed this guy, he said, I can hardly wait to get into an inner city church. Oh my goodness, you guys feed the people and you bust them in and you go after the poor and you are in missions programs and oh wow, I want to be in the streets and I want to be with those people and, 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 and go for it. And we said, okay, you're hired. First day on the job, first day, he drives in, in the morning, drops his car off in the parking lot of the staff parking site over here. And he comes back after leaving the office. First day, the back seat of his car is stolen. <laughs> Who steals the back seat of a car? <laughs> Only in San Bernardino. <laughs> I mean, if there's nothing in the back seat, they're going to get something. So he runs back in the office. He says, I can't believe it. It's unbolted. Someone took the back seat out of my car. I said, welcome to San Bernardino. <laughs> I don't know that David ever went into the streets again. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure he ever did that. But nevertheless, it was such a thing. My point being, what you place as valuable, you lock up. That's right. I didn't say tie up or hold down or, or, you know, keep them in prison. I'm saying because they're valuable, you protect them. That's a better word than locking up, isn't it? You protect them. 
And that's what value does is you're protecting your wife. You can see if you're protecting your wife if you're out in front of your wife and your walk, wife walks behind you. I love watching people. I have, Debbie loves to shop, so therefore I sit on a chair, get a cup of coffee, and watch people go by. <laughs> I, I'm just a people watcher. I, is anyone like watching people besides me? Yeah. I like people. I go watch people, you know? So people go by, and, you know, Debbie's worried I'm going to be unhappy and disappointed, and so she tries to, she doesn't like me going shopping with her because it puts pressure on her. But I don't mind. I, I really don't. And, and I see so many men. 10 or 15 feet out ahead of their wife and their wife trailing behind. I don't do that. Would you stay out of my sermon, please? So I don't do that. I have two reasons why I like to have Debbie out in front. You are bad. You are like, you're really bad, you know? So I'm just gonna tell you the first reason. First reason is I can protect her. Now I can't protect her like I used to protect her. You know what I mean? I used to be able to make a fist and come near my wife, I'm gonna smack you in the head. Now I gotta slap you. <laughs> you know, but nevertheless, I, I wanna protect her. And I'm not gonna tell you what the second reason is. Okay, I'll tell you, Grandpa likes checking out Grandma. Ooh, girl, looking good to me. And let me, don't misunderstand me. It's not as if I'm going to do anything about it, but I can still look. <laughs> and so here's placing a value on Deborah. I don't open the door for her all the time so men don't get freaky about that. If I happen to be on the same side as her, I will open the door for her. We've gotten that way, you know? But if I'm not on the same side, girl, open the door yourself. <laughs> but it doesn't mean I don't protect her and place a value on her. Come on, let's go to last one for today. Is that okay? Here it is. Last one for today found in Ephesians 531. And this is, if you will, number six. Number six, I'm just going to put it up for you. Take spiritual responsibility. Leave the past behind. Let's read a verse. Verse, if you will, uh, which I really love in Ephesians 5.31. Let's put it up on the overhead. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother. Why? Because we become one flesh. Now listen to this. And be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Such cool verse. Why do you leave? Why would somebody have to leave their father and mother? Because of the influence of the old family on the new relationship is very, at times, difficult. We have to leave some of the traditions that we were raised with from the past and start new traditions with your spouse. And sometimes we carry over. We all say, well, you don't want to be like our mom and dad, but I'm going to tell you something. The older you get, the more you look like and talk like and act like your mom and dad. You can be mad at me if you want, but it's the way it is. And oftentimes what we do is the way they live their life is the way we are comfortable in living our life. And what we're comfortable in, we will want to do again. One guy came in and counseled, I've counseled so many people over the years on the subject of marriage. He comes in and he says, well, I'm so mad at her. I'm so frustrated with my wife. She, she just doesn't listen to me at all. She's supposed to submit to me and she doesn't do anything as I ask her to do. I said, well, what's the problem? The guy says, well, every night I want our dinner on the table at 5.15 every single night. When I come home, 5.15, we eat. <laughs> I'm thinking to myself as a young pastor, I wonder if I could come over the desk and beat the crap out of this guy for just a moment in his stupidity. You know what I'm saying? I, then I thought to myself, I better not if I'm going to continue being a pastor. Because it'd be very difficult. You come in for counseling and get whooped. 
And so, so, so I, I shut that thought down. And then God spoke to me and said, ask him why he does that. I said, why do you want to eat at 515? He says, my father insisted that we eat at 515. I said, you just told me a few minutes ago you didn't even like your father. He says, doesn't matter. I'm comfortable at eating at 515. And the pressure was on her to live up to family traditions. And sometimes you have to leave the ways of your mother and father, especially if they weren't Christian, and now start to develop a new Christian responsibility and a real new Christian lifestyle with your spouse. Without it, man, it just doesn't work. My family, I'm, you know, I'm the really, the name Cobre is not even a real name. Most of you know that. I, I, it, my mother made that up because my father was a boxer and his last name was Rudolfo Cobra, the snake. And he was a price fighter, genius businessman, one of the highest business uh, uh, people on the planet. And yet, when he was young, being Italian, they were beating up Italian and persecuting Italians. And they would, everywhere he'd go, he'd get beat up. So he became a boxer to protect himself, and he became light heavyweight champion. And so of the United States military. And so he took on the name Rudolfo Cobra. Mom married him, said, I'm not going to be a snake. Put an E on the end of it, put a little thing on top of it, and made it French. Cobra. <laughs> now, with that story, that means absolutely nothing. We always had Italian food in our house. Mama just cooked for dad Italian food because he loved Italian food. And now we have a tradition in our family. We have Thanksgiving, we have turkey, and spaghetti. And I make the spaghetti. It takes me five hours to make the spaghetti, but mm, 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 mm. And all my grandkids say, Grandpa, we want your spaghetti. I said, I love you. I'm going to buy you a Porsche when you're 80, 60. And, uh, and uh, so they love Grandpa's spaghetti. And so here it is, guys. Uh, you build your own traditions. Some of you have traditions that are working for you. If they don't, throw them out and get your own. Well, my parents went on a holiday every year to the desert. Guess what? Debbie's parents did that every year. Today, we can, I can't get her to the desert. We had to design a different type of a holiday where she's away from the desert. We do that because I'm here to nourish, protect, take care of her in every area of her life. Guys, it's so simple. God wants to bless you. Three things that we learned today in the scripture. Does anybody even remember number one? Number one is to nourish. Nourish means to what? It means to take care of and provide for your wife. Number two, remember that. We found, or actually number five, is place a great value on your wife. That's cherish. And number six, leave the past behind. Leave the past by. Create new fun things that the two of you love to do together. It's absolutely going to be wonderful. If you got something from God today, come on, give the Lord a great big praise. Isn't God good? Woo! Appreciate you listening. Now, here's what we're going to do. I don't want anybody getting up and leaving.